Welcome to our third session in Angels and Demons. Glad that you're joining us. Remember to follow us on Facebook, like us on YouTube, do all that good stuff, and stay in the loop with us. Let us start with a word of prayer. The Lord be with you. Merciful and gracious God, you have created all that exists. You've brought all things into being, including angels. Continue to help us in growing and understanding what these heavenly creatures are all about and what they're not about. And help us understand who we are in your creation. Bless us to better understand who you are, O God, in the midst of this so that we can better understand who we are and that we can but give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll begin on page 19. Ranks and Numbers of Angels. He has a quote from John Milton from the hymn on the Nativity. The helmed cherubim and the sworded seraphim are seen in glittering ranks with, angel, with wings displayed. Martin Luther once suggested that there were 10 trillion angels 1,000 for each and every person on earth. With Christian, other Christians have debated the number of angels that could sit on the head of a pen. Ultimately, any speculation as to the number of angels would not reach a valid conclusion. Neither would a debate about the amount of angels in a certain location at a certain time. Based on what we've already learned about angels, why is it futile to speculate about the exact number of angels that exist or that can occupy a certain physical space at one time? Because they're gods. They belong to God. Yeah. Not of, not of our, not, none of our business, not our, it's above our pay grade. Yeah. But even think in the ancient world, they didn't even have a scope of how many humans were on the face of the earth. How many humans are on the face of the earth today? It's on changing. It keeps on changing and we only hear these speculative numbers that are based on best guesses. So we can't even say how many humans, so how could we even think about saying how many angels there are? That's up to God. All that matters is that they are there, they exist. They're God's messengers. Well, the name, rank, and serial number, as he titles it, number 24, we're gonna do some looking into scripture again. We're gonna to go to Deuteronomy, 33. Deuteronomy is in the Old Testament, I remind you. So let's go to Deuteronomy 33, and the scripture will help us to better grasp what these, uh, the name, rank, and serial number of, of angels. So chapter 33, verse 2. The beginning of this, he says in verse 1, this is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the Israelites before his death. He said, the Lord came from Sinai and dawned from Seir upon us. He shone forth from Mount Paran. With him were myriads of holy ones. At his right, a host of his own. What's a myriad? A whole bunch. Oh, I like that. Untold numbers beyond our imagination. Why would Moses use such imagery? Just to let him know, he's a, let people know that he's a real deal. I mean, you know, he's coming. He's the real deal and that God is beyond our human limitation. Yeah, good, good. Let's look at Job. We don't often get to go to Job, so let's go over to Job, the 25th chapter. Oops, went too far. 
thin pages, I tell you. Chapter 25, verses 2 and 3. Dominion and fear are with God. He makes peace in his high heaven. Is there any number of, to his armies? Upon whom does his light arise? So even here, the guy is saying, is there any number to his armies? This is, in other words, he's saying, this is, this is beyond our understanding. We can't, we can't say how many there are. So again, Scripture is pointing us to the reality that this, to, to come up with a number is beyond us. In Psalm 68, verse 17, Psalm 68, verse 17, we hear, With mighty chariotry, twice ten thousand, thousands upon thousands, the Lord came from Sinai into the holy place. Twice ten thousand, thousands upon thousands. Again, the imagery, the use of the language is pointing us to this is so far beyond our imagination to even think of a number. It's meant to be that, that, that nebulous, it's just a bunch, a lot, many, beyond our comprehension. And then we get to go over to Daniel, Daniel chapter 7. And we'll be looking at verse 10. A stream of fire issued and flowed out from his presence. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood attending him. Yes. Uh, quite true. Yeah, I know that points to remember. I did read that last night. Shocking, I don't know, but. Uh, it, uh, they talk about, and I didn't know that, the ch and I, hopefully I'm saying it correct, the cherubim um, talked about them, and they had the little hands under their wings and stuff like that. I, I never knew that they, you always see them with just the wings. You never see them with hands under their wings. And, and, Go ahead, I'm sorry. and also when you see that the wings are covering the feet, Covering the feet. That's imagery of covering private parts. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So there's modesty. And, and often we don't see their faces either. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So we're starting to get this idea that these creatures are truly beyond us and are amazing. Well, you, read, you read some of that stuff in there and it's like they got heaven, it's just like they got, you know, you feel the sky, you know what I mean? And One of the images I have, it's my image, I take it out of Revelation around when, around the throne of God, we've got the, the 12 elders and the 12 patriarchs uh, representing the 12 tribes, this idea that all of the people of God are gathered. And then I just have this expanding outward ring that just keeps going and going and going and going. And with, hum with those who have been brought into heaven, but also with the, the heavenly host, it's just this, this beyond imagination, beyond comprehension. Yeah, it talks about that and that point to remember how many they are. Yeah. Yeah. Hebrews. Let's go to Hebrews 22 or excuse me, 12, verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering. Innumerable in festal gathering. That this is a celebration. And then book of Revelations. Yes, ma'am. 
The next line talks about, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. And who would be the firstborn, do you think? That's what I'm asking you. I oh, really? <laughs> okay, so Jesus is the firstborn of the dead. You know, that he's died and been brought back. And so is this a reference to the, um, the salvation experienced at the resurrection of Jesus? Yeah. Or is this the, those who are um, Christians? It's not totally clear for us, but it's inferring that these who have, who have been redeemed by God. Yeah. Does that help? Okay. And then Revelation... Yes. Oh. Yeah, it's a good question. And we could do a study on Hebrews if that would be of interest. Hebrews is good stuff. Um, Revelation 5, verse 11. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne and the living creatures and the elders they numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, singing with full voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Worship. And we've got angels and we've got um, the living creatures and the elders. We've got all this, but number, myriads upon myriads. So how do the passages describe the numbers? Massive, overwhelming, beyond our imagination. So then let's look at Matthew 26, 53. How many angels could Christ have summoned to his aid in the Garden of Gethsemane? What does this imply about our Savior? So, and okay, so what's that add up to? I don't know. I don't know how many is in the legion. 144, I think, or 144,000. It adds up to 72,000. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's 6,000. Yeah. So for those at home, tw uh, 2653 in Matthew reads so that you get this number at home. Do you think I cannot appeal to my Father and he will once send me more than 12 legions of angels? So it's more than 72,000. 12 legions is 72,000, but that's more. Think about how many, there were not that many Roman soldiers in Jerusalem at that time. This is obviously, again, an imagery that's telling us our Savior could call upon the myriads of myriads and would have been duly defended. Now, he chose not to because he was fulfilling God's will, the Father's will. Look at number 26. Read Romans 8, 38 through 39. We do a lot of Bible reading in this class. Romans 8. Thirty-eight and thirty-nine. Paul writes, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So are angels able to separate us from God? No, that's not their role. So it's telling us something there again. Now let's go over to Paul's writing in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, and also we'll hit part of chapter 3. So in Ephesians 1, 21, Paul, he likes long sentences, but he says, God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Verse 21, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. 
So he's getting us to look at Christ being above the angels. So this is a part of it. Now let's hold that thought until we get over to verse 10 in chapter 3. So that through the church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So what is this trying to say? What are you hearing in this? We've got that Jesus could have called all these angels. We've got that angels cannot separate us from the love of God in Christ. We've got Christ who is over the heavenly authorities, the heavenly beings. Again, let's go then to Colossians 1.16. Which reads, well, let's do the verse before, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. Angels? You betcha. Angels were created through and for him, and he is over. Jesus Christ is over the angels. And then um, we'll go to 1 Peter. Chapter 3, verse 22. Who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Some Christians find in these and other passages as many as 27 ranks divisions of angels. Is there perhaps a better way of interpreting these passages? What I'm hearing is that angels are messengers. They, you know, God and Christ created them. And yeah, I guess they probably all have their different job descriptions. But Jesus is over them. Yeah. yeah. So the number is not, we're not meant to get caught up in the number. Well, let's go to 27, and we're going to go back to Deuteronomy again. Or to Daniel, I'm sorry. I saw a D and I went right to Deuteronomy. So we'll go to Daniel, Daniel chapter 10. Thin pages. This will be verse 13, which reads, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia opposed me 21 days. So Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I left him there with the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Okay, what's this sounding like to you? And Michael, one of the archangels. Yes. So he's listed as a prince, okay? And given that name there, Michael, who is an archangel. Um, but also then, what's this thing, the prince of the kingdom of Persia? Remember the ancient understanding of religions, the ancient understanding of beings. It means that there's a being that was against him, and Michael came and defends him. Michael the archangel shows up because he is of the house of Israel. He, uh, the, the, the idea being God sends God's beings to defend, to protect, and Michael is that one here. So let's go a little further. We've got in chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael, the great prince, the protector of your people, shall arise. There shall be a time of anguish such as never occurred since nations first came into existence. But at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. So Michael is a defender of God's people, an angel whose role is to take and defend God's people. So let's look at 1 Thessalonians now. Chapter 4, verse 16. 
which reads, For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Talking about the end time, but again, what we're hearing is the archangel comes at Christ's behest, bequest. He does, the archangel is doing God's bidding. The archangel is protecting God's people. And here when Christ returns, the archangel comes with. Let's keep going and we'll look at Jude. Good old Jude, which we don't hear from very often. Jude 9, which says, Where are you? There we go. But when the archangel Michael contended with the devil and disputed about the body of Moses, he did not dare to bring a condemnation of slander against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. So again, the archangel is doing the bidding of God. The archangel is interceding with what God wants. The Bible clearly teaches only two ranks or divisions of angels. What is the rank of angels mentioned in these verses, and what is his name? So there are archangels, and the name that we know is Michael. So if you've got somebody named Michael in your family, the original point of naming a child Michael in the Christian faith or in Jewish faith was remembering the archangel. Many of our folks may not know that, but that's what was going on. So let's go to Isaiah chapter 6. verses 2 through 6. And here we have the beautiful vision of God in the temple, the prophet Isaiah having this, this amazing experience. Um, it started at verse 1, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lofty. The hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Beautiful vision of what he experienced in the role of the seraph. The seraph was attending. It's like a worship assistant, if you will, to God, you know, Offering up praise, but also serving. Describe their appearance and activities. We meet a specific kind. What is the, so what did we pick up on? We always see angels with two wings, right? Wrong. We had six wings. That's six wings. What we were talking about with six wings, two to fly, two to cover face, two to cover feet. Yeah. How beautiful. Won't it be amazing when we see that? When we are ca when caught up into God's eternity with that. <laughs> On this side, yes. <laughs> sure. There it'll be totally okay. Let's go over to Genesis. Genesis chapter 3. 
And this is beautiful because we're seeing through Scripture this continuum of, of God's um, outpouring of how things are. We're able to follow the pattern and see what God is up to. Uh, Genesis 3, verse 24. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a sword flaming and turning to guard the way to the tree of life. This is when they're cast out of the garden. Does it sound like the cherubim are there to be sweet and kind? No. So how the heck are they selling Charmin toilet paper? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? They want us to clean up our act. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> they want us to clean up our act. But, you know, we've used that in, you know, um, humans have used the imagery and we like the cherubs are sweet and kind. It's like, I'm not so sure. But exactly, he's only following orders. And in this case, it's a little stern. Yeah. So let's look at Exodus 25. And this is a little longer reading. Starting at verse 10. And you shall hallow the 50th year, and you shall proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. You shall return everyone to every one of you to your property and every one of you to your family. That 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. You shall not sow or reap the aftergrowth or harvest the unpruned vines, for it is a jubilee. It shall be holy to you. You shall eat only what the field itself produces. In this year a jubilee, you shall return every one of you to your property. When you make a sale to your neighbor or buy from the neighbor, you shall not cheat one another. When you buy from your neighbor, you shall pay only the number of years since the Jubilee. The seller shall charge you only for the remaining crop years. If the years are more, you shall increase the price, and if the years are fewer, you shall diminish the price, for it is a certain number of harvest that are being sold to you. You shall not cheat one another, but you shall fear the Lord, for I am the Lord your God. You shall observe my statutes and faithfully keep my ordinances so that you may live on the land securely. The land will yield its fruit, and you shall eat your fill and live on it securely. Should you ask, what shall we eat in the seventh year if we may not sow or gather in our crop? I will order my blessing for you in the sixth year so that it will yield a crop for three years. When you sow in the eighth year, you will be eating from the old crop until the ninth year. Then its produce comes in. You shall eat the old. The land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine. With me you are but aliens and tenants. Throughout the land you hold, you shall provide for the redemption of the land." And we got more. Then go over to 2631. And verse 31 says, I will lay your cities waste, will make your sanctuaries desolate, and I will not smell your pleasing odors. So it's not sounding real good. Um, and then 36, oh, you know what? And I'm reading this going, this isn't making sense. So it does help if you're in the right book. That's Leviticus, folks. Do pastors make mistakes? We sure do. I'm reading along going, and with confidence going, okay, I don't remember this being what it's supposed to be, but. No, I was in the wrong book. I was in Leviticus, so ignore in Leviticus on that. <sighs> Verse 10, in chapter 25 of Exodus, they shall make an ark of acacia wood. 
It shall be two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. You shall overlay it with pure gold inside and out. You shall overlay it and you shall make a molding of gold upon it all around. You shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them on its four feet two rings on the one side of it, two rings on the other side. You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold, and you shall put the poles into the rings on the side of the ark by which to carry the ark. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. You shall put it into the ark, into the ark of the covenant that I shall give you. Then you shall make a mercy seat a pure gold, two cubits and a half shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its width. You shall make two cherubim of gold. You shall make them of hammered work at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at the one end and one cherub at the other of one piece with the mercy seat. You shall make the cherubim at, um, at its two ends. The cherubim shall spread out their wings over the overshadow, above overshadowing the mercy seat. With their wings they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be turned toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark. And in the ark you shall put the covenant that I shall give you. There I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat from heaven, from between the two cherubim that are on the Ark of the Covenant, I will deliver you all my commands for the Israelites. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. Cherubim, cherubim again. Then let's go over to chapter 26, verse 31. You shall make a curtain of blue, purple, and crimson yarns, and of fine twisted linen, it shall be made with cherubim skillfully worked into it. Think of upholstery fabric, of the making of fabric. And here, you're to have the images of the cherubim. Yeah, the images of the cherubim are to be there as well, reminding them of these heavenly creatures that serve God. And these representing that you're going to come into the presence of God. In verse 8 in chapter 36, all those with skill among the workers made the tabernacle with ten curtains. They were made of fine twisted linen and blue, purple, and crimson yarns with cherubim skillfully worked into them. So the cherubim image on the curtain is reminding them also of the cherubim on the top of the Ark of the Covenant, which is reminding them of the cherubim that serve God. Are they to worship them? The cherubim? No. Guards. Yeah. Of God's holiness. Yeah. So they're, they're not to be worshipped, but they are there, and those physical reminders are to remind us that they are present. What did this kind of angel do in the Garden of Eden? Well, shut the gate if you know. defend it against. And how were they artistically portrayed? We just heard that about in the wilderness. So now let's look at the throne of God. The God of Abram, Isaac, and Jacob is King of kings and Lord of lords. It is only fitting then that God should have a throne. So now we're taking and dealing with the throne of God. So let's go to 1 Samuel. Hello, where'd you go? There you would be. My tab is out of place. Looking for 1 Samuel and going, where'd you go? Because I don't see the tab, but there it is. So chapter 4, verse 4. Chapter 4, verse 4 reads, So the people sent to Shiloh and brought from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. The two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. 
Okay, so what do we get? Again, we have the image of the cherubim. Now let's go to 2 Kings chapter 19. Verse 15. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord, the God of Israel, who are enthroned above the cherubim, you are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. So he's appealing to God, and again, where is God enthroned? Above the cherubim. Now let's go to Psalms. Let's go to Psalms. Uh, we'll go to Psalm 80. Psalm 80, we're getting there, verse 1. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. You are enthroned upon the cherubim. Shine forth. And then Psalm 99. Verse 1, the Lord is king, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. cherubim, let the earth quake. What do these passages infer about God's throne and mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant and the golden cherubim? Sometimes he's on it, sometimes he's over it. Yeah. He's somehow God is, these cherubim have a service to God in a unique way. And they are between us and God at that point also. Not separating us, but serving God. And then let's go over to Genesis for our next question. Genesis 3.24. Again, we've heard he drove out the man, and at the east of, end of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a sword flaming, turning to guard the way of the tree to the tree of life. So we've got, again, the Garden of Eden. Um, we've got in 2 Samuel, in 2 Samuel, chapter um, 22. Another image to pick up on. Verse 11. He rode on a cherub and flew. He was seen upon the wings of the wind. Beautiful description. Wow. And then again in Psalm 18. We have another image to look at. Gives us more information. Psalm 18, verse 10 reads, He rode on a cherub and flew. He came swiftly upon the wings of the wind, which is repeating the second Samuel. According to these passages, what is the function of cherubim? He rides them. Yeah. God, they assist in his travel, God's travel. Um, what work do they perform? Well, they're serving God. And why do you think God is described as riding them? Well, I think they're probably carrying rather than, yeah. I mean, I don't. No, 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 I think you're right. right. The image is not he forcibly riding, but rather being carried upon. Right. Yeah, that makes sense because, I mean, they, they carried kings on those chariots where a bunch of guys were holding poles with the king on it. And sometimes God shows his presence to us in ways that we can relate to. 
Yes. That's the exact imagery. Because what we, why do we do that with a king? It shows they are elevated. It shows they are somehow better. They are somehow uh, glorified by that. And in many ancient kingdoms, you know, what is the line of the monarchy? They are appointed by God. So now the description given to God, who is our king of kings, remember Old Testament, what was the desire of God's people? They wanted a king like everybody else. Did God want that? No. no, for he wanted, God wanted to serve as their king, yet they didn't see God that way. So then he gets Saul, who was a bad king. Then God gives them what they want again, but he appoints then David, who is the ideal Jewish king. Under David, the kingdom expanded to the largest that it would be. Was David a good guy? He's portrayed as being good, but you know, he was not nice to his neighbors at all. And he sinned. The Bathsheba story, you know, adultery, murder. He, he was a rogue. Yet he was a man after God's own heart. And that's why he was an ideal king. And then would, did God allow David to build him a temple, uh, to build him a home? No. He said, you're a man of war, you can't do this, but your son will do it. So David got together all the um, Arctic architectural plans for it. And David, um, and David became a kingdom. Yes. You know, I'm not going to build you a house, but I'll make you a house, David. You know, I, you don't, you're not going to build my house, but I'm going to build you into a house that will last forever. Then we have Solomon, and Solomon went off the rail. And after Solomon, the kingdom divides and everything falls apart again. But we've got that imagery. God wanted to be their king. They, he didn't want the, his people to rely on an earthly king. And man, don't we do that. Don't we do that. Good. Huh? Uh-huh. Yep, pretty powerful. Our next section here, it says, we're in heaven. Not only were artistic representations of cherubim prominent in Moses' wilderness tabernacle, they also figured in the Jerusalem temple. These representations were highly significant of an unseen spiritual reality rarely seen by the human eye. So now we're going to go back into 1 Kings, and we've got a reading out of chapter 6, starting at verse 23. In the inner sanctuary, he made two cherubim of olive wood, each ten cubits high. Five cubits was the length of one wing of the cherub, and five cubits the length of the other wing of the cherub. It was ten cubits from the tip of one wing to the tip of the other. The other cherub also measured ten cubits. Both cherubim had the same measure and the same form. The height of one cherub was ten cubits, so, that what the other cher so was that of the other cherub. He put the cherubim in the innermost part of the house, the wings of the cherubim were spread out so that a wing of one was touching the one wall and a wing of the other was touching the other wall. Their other wings toward the center of the house were touching wing to wing. He also overlaid the cherubim with gold. He carved the walls of the house all around about the, with carved engravings of cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers. In the inner and outer rooms, the floor of the house he overlaid with gold, the inner and the outer rooms. For the entrance to the inner sanctuary, he made doors of olive wood. The lintel and the doorsteps were five-sided. He covered the two doors of olive, olive wood with carvings of cherubim. 
palm trees and open flowers. He overlaid them with gold and spread gold on the cherubim and on the palm trees. So also he made for the entrance to the nave doorpost of olive wood, four sided each, and two doors of cypress wood. The two leaves of the one door were folding and the two leaves of the other door were folding. He carved cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers, overlaying them with gold, evenly applied on the wood car or the carved wood. A lot of carving, a lot of olive wood, a lot of palm trees, flowers, and gold and cherubim. So again, there's images of the cherubim. You can get olive wood, but that's a lot of olive wood. Those were big, big pieces they needed. Yeah, there's there a lot of um, in the Holy Land. A lot of craftsmen do carvings out of olive wood, but so but they're not massive pieces typically. Um, partly because they have to travel home on an airplane most often. You know, but, but yeah, these are large things that are being described at the temple. And then chapter 7, starting at verse 29, we hear more of this. On the borders that were in, set in for the frames were lions, oxen, and cherubim. I won't read this whole section because we can all read that, but we get the idea of all these images of cherubim being added in to the temple. Why? That's the question. What is the, what is the function of the temple? Worship. worship. But why the temple? Why couldn't they worship over, say, by the Dead Sea? Why they why did they what? God's house, but, so what was in the Holy of Holies? The Ark. the Ark of the Covenant. And where was, what was on the top of the Ark of the Covenant? Cherubim. Cherubim. And they were guarding, protecting, surrounding the mercy seat. The mercy seat. The locus of God touching earth. For the Jewish people, was God's presence around, but where did, yes, but where was God living? Where was God centered? In the, in the temple, in the Holy of Holies, on the mercy seat. So, the imagery here is very intentional because it's reflective of heaven. It's reflective in this holy, sacred space of God's heavenly location. So that's why we have all these image of cherubim taking place. Okay, can we go back real quick to the mercy scene? I'm confused about that. I thought it was just like a, like a throne just here on earth. Okay. And that's where God's presence dwells, on earth. So that they, they could only go, the high priest could go in one day a year. They'd tie an ankle around, or a rope around his ankle to pull him out if he falls out, because no one else could go in there, because this is so holy, because this is where God's presence is located. And the people of God would pilgrim, take pilgrimage trips to the temple, because that's where God is located for them. Okay. And they go to the temple and just worship and worship. Offer burnt offerings. Okay. And then the burnt offering, the, it's the aroma that arises to God. Okay. Yeah. And then the priest would eat a part of the, the, burn, or the, uh, the meat that's been cooked and burnt. Yeah. So it's a, so the imagery is intentional because of the cherubim being heavenly creatures that surround God. Does that start to... Yeah. There's an intentionality. There's a reason why this is there. 
Well, one, more, one more quick question about the arc. Um, I, a lot of times you see in the movies, they'll be moving the arc, and somebody will touch it, and that's it, they, their ticket is punched. Mm -hmm. But then I read it, and I do that little daily reading, and yep. uh, somehow or another, some foreigners got hold of the arc, and then they realized what they had, and they wanted to get rid of it quickly. You know, they wanted it back, you know, and yep. it made several stops. So I guess you can move it, you could have moved it, Remember we read about these um, rods that would go through the rings? Right. You can touch, servants, they could touch the rods oh, okay. because the rods are touching the rings and the rings are attached so they're not touching the ark. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. okay. that's, how they, that's how they could move it. Okay. You remember uh, at one point they were, uh, they were gonna take the ark back and um, they hadn't read the instruction manual, so they put it in an ox cart, and one of the oxen stumbled, and someone had reached out and touched the ark to study it, and... You, you are correct, yeah, so I forgot that part. Yeah. yeah. You're right, yeah. 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 I'm just trying to piece it all together so much. No, that's wonderful. That's what, you know, and that's, the more that we're in study, the more we'll grasp things in little pieces and they start to come together. It gives us better understanding. Let's go to our next reading. We're going to jump down to number 33 and it's going to be in Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 3. Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub on which it rested to the threshold of the house. The Lord called to the man clothed in linen who had the writing case at his side. So again, we have an image of the cherub. Verse 10, or chapter 10, 1 through 22. Then I looked and above the dome that was over the heads of the cherubim, there appeared above them something like a sapphire in form resembling a throne. He said to the man clothed in linen, go within the wheelwork underneath the cherubim, fill your hands with burning coals from among the cherubim and scatter them over the city. He went in as I looked on. Now the cherubim were standing on the south side of the house when the man went in and a cloud filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord rose up from the cherub to the threshold of the house. The house was filled with the cloud and the court was full of the brightness of the glory of the Lord. the Lord. The sound of the wings of the cherubim was heard as far as the outer court, like the voice of God Almighty when he speaks. Then when uh, he commanded the man clothed in linen, take fire from within the wheelwork, from among the cherubim, he went in and stood beside the wheel, and a cherub stretched out its hand from the among the cherubim to the fire that was among the cherubim, took some of it and put it into the hands of the man clothed in linen, who took it and went out. The cherubim appeared to have the form of a human hand under their wings. I looked, and there were four wheels beside the cherubim, one beside each cherub, and the appearance of the wheels was like gleaming burl. And as for their appearance, the four looked alike, something like a wheel within a wheel. When they moved, they moved in a way of the four directions without veering as they moved. But in whatever direction the front wheel faced, the others followed without veering as they moved. Their entire body, their rims, their spokes, their wings, and the wheels, and the wheels of the four of them were full of eyes all around. As for the wheels, they were called in my hearing the wheel work. Each one had four faces. The fa first face was that of a cherub. The second face was that of a human being. The third was that of a lion, and the fourth was that of an eagle. The cherubim rose up. These were the living creatures that I saw by the river Chabar. When the cherubim moved, 
the wheels moved beside them, and when the cherubim lifted up their wings to rise up from the earth, the wheels of their side did not veer. When they stopped, the others stopped, and when they rose up, the others rose up with them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in them. Then the glory of the Lord went out from the threshold of the house and stopped above the cherubim, the cherubim lifted up their wings and rose up from the earth in my sight as they went out with the wheels beside them. They stopped at the entrance of the east gate of the house of the Lord, and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. They were the living creatures that I saw underneath the God of Israel by the river Chabar, and I knew that they were cherubim. Each had four faces, each four wings, and underneath their wings something like human hands. As for what their faces were like, they were the same faces whose appearance I had seen by the river Chabar. Each one moved straight ahead. Anybody ready to fall out? <laughs> <laughs> Reading that number four comes up quite a bit. Mm -hmm. you got the four wheels, the four cherubims, the four faces, the four wings, four, four, four. I think it crops up in a couple of the uh, I think too in the revelations it shows up. But is there any significance to the four, or is I just looking for stuff? No, there, there's always a significance in the numerology. I don't remember the exact meaning of the four, but I can look that up. I can look that up. Um, I need to. I need to. Before I answer, I need to. Well, I'm, I didn't mean to. You know. I thought it was just kind of interesting that they, because yeah. it seems like it's different. They got the four faces, and you know. So I got that they were. His hands and feet, so to speak. Yeah. They, could, they were physically doing things, and God wasn't doing that, but had commanded them to do. And their little hands are a little freaky. Yeah. They can reach out and hold coals. And yeah. <laughs> I know. I do a lot of barbecue, and those coals is hot. <laughs> <laughs> we got a little bit more. The, over in chapter 11, then the cherubim lifted up their wings with the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was above them, and the glory of the Lord ascended from the middle of the city and stopped on the mountain east of the city. We just keep having these cherubim who are direct servants to tend to God. So what does it depict? It depicts the heavenly creatures, and what are they about? They're serving God. Wow, so let's go a little bit further. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 25, verse 20. We're going to take another look there. I will not go to Leviticus like I did earlier, because that would be wrong. Verse 20 of chapter 25 reads, the cherubim shall spread out their wings above overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings. They shall face one to another. The faces of the cherubim shall be turned toward the mercy seat. Why are the golden cherubim looking at the mercy seat? Because that's where God's presence is going to be. They can look at God and not die. What did they emphasize of God's Old Testament people? That these cherubs are direct servants of God. They're heavenly creatures who tend to God. And what should this fact emphasize for us today? Cherubim are not meant to be selling toilet paper. <laughs> Cherubim continue as eternal servants to God. They are doing you know, a, a role of worship and adoration and accommodation for God's needs, God's desire. It's beautiful. So let's, you, if you read through the comparisons, um, 
that they have here, you can, you can do that on your own. And the point to remember they lift up. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. The point that we get is that the heavenly creatures, angels, are so beyond us. It is not our task to know the number. It is not our task to know the names. It is not our task to somehow try to explain it. What we're given is the imagery of what these heavenly creatures do. That they are servants of God. And with the cherubim, we see that special role that they have. So this is beautiful. It's beautiful. And our angels meant, are meant for something for us to be scared of. I don't think so. Deep yeah. respect, but not necessarily fear. Yeah. Respect because they're creatures of God and what they're doing. And if, if we are opposed to God, then perhaps there's a problem with the angels. But the angels, you know, as the created order, they are serving God. And we are humans formed in God's very image who are loved by God. In the creation, we are above angels. But the angels have this special role. Thoughts? Or that God's up to something. Yeah. 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 Next time, we will talk about good and evil angels. In other words, demons. So we'll get into that next time. Let's join in a word of prayer. The Lord be with you. Bless us, O God, to join in the song of the angels in giving praise to you. Bless us, O God, to respect and honor you and to recognize the special role angels have in your created order and help us but to turn to you with thanksgiving and praise. Watch over us as we go out this day. Help us in our endeavors. Be with those who are ill or those who are seeing doctors and bring comfort to all. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Remember to like us on Facebook, follow us on YouTube, and stay connected with us. See you next time.